Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with Beto Arcos in conversation with Tom Schnabel to discuss music stories from the Cosmic Barrio. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website by signing up for our email newsletter, as well as following us on social media at Book Soup. And you can even follow us here on our podcast page. Our next event is this coming Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific with Edward Hirsch and Kate Daniels to discuss 100 poems to break your heart. And past events are also available on our YouTube channel. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A and to submit a question, please use the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button and we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And please also feel free to engage with each other in the conversation in the chat area. And we were just talking about motorcycles driving by. I don't know if you heard, but one just sped by me. Um, also, please support Book Soup and our author tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can do by clicking on the green purchase button right below the viewer screen. This link will redirect you to our website where you can finish the checkout process and it will not interrupt the viewing. So you can do that at any time. And we're also selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those interested. Also a note, we are open for in-store browsing. So if you don't like to buy books online and you are local, please come to the store daily from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we would love to see you. As you all, I'm sure know, it's really important time to support independent bookstores. It's always important, but especially through COVID. So um, we really greatly appreciate any and all support. And with all that said, let me introduce our guests for this evening. A native of Salapa, Veracruz, Mexico. I hope I said that right. Beto Arcos is an independent producer, music curator, and educator. Since 2009, he's been a regular contributor to NPR, writing stories about Latin and world music. Beto is the Latin music curator at the San Jose Jazz Festival. In addition to his public radio work, Beto has also collaborated in a number of recording projects and was music supervisor of two documentary films. He developed the music component for the course Religion in Latin American Imagination at Harvard University. Beto graduated with honors in journalism from the University of Colorado in 1993. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Beto. And our in conversation guest, Tom Schnabel, is an internationally recognized radio producer, pioneer, and innovator in world music. He helped introduce world music to American audiences as KCRW's first music director and host of Morning Becomes Eclectic from 1979 to 1991. Tom is the author of two books, Stolen Moments, Conversations with Contemporary Musicians and Rhythm Planet, The Great World Music Makers. He has produced a number of recordings and provides music supervision for advertising and movies. He has also served as program advisor for the Hollywood Bowl and Walt Disney Concert Hall. Tom has taught at multiple universities in Los Angeles, including UCLA Extension and even in Paris. His new project at KCRW Rhythm Planet showcases the best in jazz and world music. And we're so excited to have them both here with us tonight. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera over to Beto and Tom and please sit back, relax and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Sam. Hello, Beto. Nice to see you. Hey, Tom. Good to see you, Tom. So, I want to start by reading a short passage in, in, in the intro of your book, Music Stories from the Cosmic Barrio. And I want to tell you personally and to the audience that you are a true melomon, which means a lover of music like me. But you're also able to connect music to the lives of regular people, not only in our own familiar culture, but all over the world. And I'd like to start and set it up by reading an excerpt from your introduction to music from stories from the Cosmic Barrio. You say, with regard to Latin American music, it's not only about translating a language or a style of music, but explaining who we are, the complexity of our music, of our history and diverse cultures, the hopes and dreams yet to be fulfilled by future generations. You continue. Every story I've written about music and identity, music and immigration, music and education, music and commu community building has to do with who I am as a person. Music has the power to transform lives. I know it has transformed mine. So that's the in introduction and I, I, love, I love those words. So let's start by why did you title your, your, your book music 
stories from the Cosmic Barrio. The Cosmic Barrio sounds a little bit Grateful Dead to me, but I'll let you explain. Yeah. Well, you know, um, many years ago when I was music director at uh, KPFK, I, I had to create a, a weekend program. And I reached out to a friend of mine, actually a poet, also from Los Angeles and a writer, uh, Ruben Martinez. And I asked him uh, to help me find a name for that program. And, and that program, just like, you know, like you used to host Cafe LA, I wanted that program to bring together the sounds of the city, the sounds of Los Angeles into one two hour show. And uh, a day later or so, he called me and, and he says, I have a name for you. And he says, The Cosmic Barrio. And, and that name stayed with me since. This was, you know, something like 20 years ago. Um, later on, about uh, 10 years ago or so, eight years ago, I created a podcast, which I called the same, The Cosmic Barrio. And then um, last year, when I decided to put together this book, I felt that uh, I needed something, you know, along the same lines. And I said, well, you know, I already have a name for this concept. The Cosmic Barrio is something that I always, you know, want to kind of, tell people about it's this sort of mythical place where people come together and listen to some great music maybe it's live maybe it's listening to records they come together in a kind of harmonious way and they have a great time and it's friends it's relatives it's family it's a community and they eat some great food and they have a great time that's to me the cosmic barrio excellent yes i i want to go there right away after our talk tonight <laughs> tell us your earliest music memories um including the singing cricket yeah um i was about six years old when i probably tuned in to a radio station in my hometown of jalapa veracruz in mexico and it was my mother that used to tune into the radio and the the program uh, uh, was called um, uh, Legion of Early Morning Risers or something like that. And it was a, a program for kids. That program, at the heart of the program, was the music of Francisco Gabilondo Soler. Cricri -cri was his nickname, uh, or the singing cricket, as you said. These... Um, songs that he wrote which are engraved truly in my you know dna in my brain in my memory were really like small kind of complicated tunes that not only had all kinds of sounds of music from different parts of the world you could hear you know you could hear swing you could hear caribbean music you could hear european waltz you know you could hear all kinds of different qualities in the music but he also told stories. The songs told stories, specific stories about this or that character. And to me, that was, you know, the most important part of that program. The songs that I identified with, the songs that told a story. Radio has been a very important part of your musical life. Tell us a little more. Yeah, um, well, it's funny. I, you know, I, I had my sort of debut when I was about eight years old. I, I remember I went on this, you know, um, kind of a competition, if you will, during Christmas. And I was about eight or nine years old. And they were asking people to come up to the stage. I didn't know that they were broadcasting live uh, to, to come to the stage and sing a whatever Christmas song we wanted to. So I went up on the stage in downtown, my hometown, and, and I went up and sang The Little Drummer Boy in Spanish, a cappella. I had no idea that this program, this, this event was being broadcast live on a radio station. You know, a few days later, or a week later, my uh, sister-in-law said, hey, I heard you on the radio. <laughs> you were singing The Little Drummer Boy. I said, what? <laughs> That was on the radio? <laughs> I said, yeah. She says, of course, you know, it was a, they were broadcasting the entire, uh, you know, contest that they were having for, you know, people to come up and sing. So that, and then, and then, of course, you know, in my father's shop, 
uh, he was a carpenter. My brothers would tune in to all kinds of radio stations. My dad would listen to the radio at night. He would listen to XEW, which was, you know, in Mexico, as you probably know, the, the, some of the stations had really powerful signals. The famous, uh, you know, W that was broadcasting on the U.S.-Mexico border going back to the 1930s. Um, so these stations were, you could hear them all over the country. So my dad would tune into, you know, the station from Mexico City or the station from uh, Monterrey in northern Mexico. And he would listen to all of these programs. And, and of course, you know, I was there. <laughs> I was listening to Musica Norteña. You know, I was listening to Agustin Lara, the, the special program that he had. You know, he had a program called, you know, La Hora Azul or the Blue Hour. And, of course, you know, boleros, all kinds of, you know, Cuban music that, that he would listen to. So radio was very present all the way you know into my adolescence all the way into my college years it was very much there with me and even when i was a cab driver in my hometown i turned into the radio to the local radio public radio station and listened to you know the the noon concert you know tchaikovsky or beethoven or whatever you know i was i was driving a cab and listening you know to to the classical radio station so it's been with me forever <laughs> Years ago, I drove uh, by myself across the country, and you'd be in the middle of nowhere, and there was no reception, uh, AM or, or FM or, or anything, and all of a sudden, Wolfman Jack would burst out of the radio from XERB, which was a bigger station than any of the 50,000-watt stations in the country. So you would hear him, he would just burst, and he would like, you'd be falling asleep at the wheel, and he would wake you up with some great rhythm and blues song. Do you remember Wolfman Jack? Of course I do, and, and not only that, you know, the station that, in a sense, launched the career of many, I mean, artists from the U.S., including the Carter family back in the 1930s, was this radio station that was you know, on the on the Mexican side of the border. But the, you know, the studio was set up on the U.S. side. And that's where the studio, you know, that would have this radio station that would have all of these programs that, you know, there was this guy that was some sort of guy that wanted to be like a, like a, uh, you know, selling some sort of, you know, medicine or some product. And he would have all the stars of, you know, the early country music would come to that station to play. And of course, everybody heard all these, you know, uh, all, all these musicians across the, across the U.S. Uh, but but I remember, of course, Wolfman Jack had one of the most popular radio shows in the, in North America. <laughs> it sure was. Yeah. So I want to ask you about immigration and start with a very personal note. You came into this country as an immigrant, undocumented, with no papers, and how has that affected? just your, your attitude towards music and I guess towards, towards life. You know, that's a good, that's a really good question, Tom. Um, I think empathy more than anything else. I think what has um, touched me as a, you know, as a, as a person, as a, and then later as a, as a writer, as a, as a DJ, you know, hosting a radio program, I had, this amazing interest, you know, in listening to music from all over the place. But at the heart of my interest, I think, was this the sort of empathy, this identification that I had with musicians, no matter where they were from, no matter, you know, what they were about and, and, their, and their story. There was something special, I think, about, about that. I mean, as you said, I, you know, I... And, and it's important to note, I came to this country in the mid-1980s when things were not the way they are right now. It was a lot easier for you know uh, us immigrants during that period. Um, but I was still undocumented. In fact, you know, the first couple of years uh, as, a, as a radio DJ in Boulder, Colorado, the program I hosted uh, called Latin Jam I didn't have any papers. I didn't even have a you know uh, a driver's license, <laughs> and I was doing a radio show uh, then. And so, I think um, you know to to sort of answer your question, I think that I am definitely influenced by that experience. I think that there is something about 
you know, someone that comes to this country uh, to look for, you know, a, a better life, to, to find a better life. And, and I think that I've built this kind of special connection to, to musicians, to artists, uh, no matter where they're from. That's very evident in the book, the way you do your interviews, the way you approach the musicians. It's done from a very humble way of wanting to know more about them. Um, I was very, very taken by that. I mean, sometimes I get these things, these, you know, emails of people doing PhD uh, dissertations on world music, and it's all very formalistic, and it has nothing to do with the sort of things that we read in your book or the sort of things that, that I'm interested in, how music reflects the lives, hopes, dreams of people. So given, given that, um, you organize your book and your chapters according thematically according to certain themes. Um, why did you do it that way? And then we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, um, the, the, the main reason really was to help the reader see beyond the music making aspect of each individual or, or group. I felt that I wanted to, you know, see, you know, put myself on the side of the reader and, and say, you know, what is what is it besides the music aspect of this musician? What is it about this musician that is compelling, that has a story to tell? And, you know, as 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 you know, in the book, I cover music from almost every other angle. It's not just about the creation of music, of the, the art, the creativity, you know, of, of playing an instrument or singing a song. It's it's the story behind the music making. So every story in the book is connected to uh, identity, to uh, education, to power, to immigration. There are, you know, just 12 chapters. And I, I felt like, you know, once I started to organize them thematically, everything was falling into place naturally. Because ultimately, Tom, to me, what's important here is the story behind the music. That really, to me, is is at the heart of, of every story. Every musician has a story to tell that's not just about creation, the creation of music. Well, with that, let's dig into the first chapter, which is identity, and talk about four artists that are there. Yeah. Well, Dafra Youssef, um, musician from Tunisia. Uh, here's a musician who, uh, you know, used to be um, one of these uh, kids. He was about 12 years old when he was doing the call to prayer from, you know, he was a muezzin, you know, one of these, you know, folks who go up to the tower and call, make the call to prayer. Uh, and then one day he listens to, uh, or watches actually, a musician from Tunisia play the oud, you know, that, that uh, well-known instrument from the Middle East, the sort of the quintessential Arab instrument, uh, Anwar Brahem, and he is transformed. He sees Anwar Brahem on television playing the instrument in a non-traditional way. He's not playing religious music. He's not playing the typical classical music, but he's playing something different. And that uh, inspired him to pick up the instrument and to, you know, go and study in, in, in Europe and become who he is today, one of the fantastic musicians that plays not only the oud, he, but he also composes, he arranges, and he's a fantastic singer as well. Very powerful singer, and he does some beautiful work on an album called Cantus with a, a choir, with a string quartet that is just extraordinary. Yeah. Let's talk about Tonya La Negra talking about amazing voices. Tonya La Negra, I remember listening to her when, you know, when I was uh, six or seven years old, when my father tuned into the radio and he would listen to these, you know, singers from various parts of Latin America. And Tonya La Negra happens to be from Veracruz, from the port city of Veracruz, which is where I'm from. And um, she is one of these exceptionally gifted artist who comes from a family of musicians uh, her her two brothers were uh, also 
very important musicians in the sort of Afro-Caribbean music of Mexico, the Peregrino brothers. Her last name was Peregrino. Um, they, you know, had a life. They had a, a sort of a local career in Veracruz. She moved to Mexico City uh, with her uh, husband and, and a child. And next thing you know, um, Agustin Lara, Mexico's great composer, discovers her. And she becomes his muse. He is inspired by Tonya La Negra to write some of his best known songs uh, that have to do with the Afro presence, with the African presence in Mexico. Uh, Lamento Jarocho, Noche Criolla, uh, Veracruz, so many others that, that he composed specifically inspired that you know he wanted those songs to be performed by Tonya La Negra. This is, you know, a very important singer from Mexico and probably the most well-known singer from Veracruz. No question about it. She had an incredible voice, like dark velvet, and I understand yeah. why he wanted to work with her. Tell us about Carlos Nunez. We're moving to Carlos Spain. Nunez is no doubt the most important gaita musician, uh, Celtic musician from Spain. Uh, He's from Galicia. He's from Vigo, one of the, the largest city, actually, in Galicia. And um, he has been playing this music since he was a little kid. Um, you know, he had various teachers. Now, you have to remember the period in which he grows up. He grows up under Franco. Um, and under Franco, music that is not flamenco, that is not coplas, that is not from southern Spain, Andalusian uh, Spain, is not really approved of, it's not really okay. So Galician music, Catalonian music, especially not even singing in a, in a language that's not Spanish, it was not okay. Uh, so he lived uh, under those conditions. Um, and then of course, when things opened up in the mid uh, to late 1970s and the country finally ushered in democracy and uh, a new government, you know, democratic government uh, was, you know, voted in things began to change. And this is where you see the explosion of music in different parts of Spain. And Carlos Nunez is really at the forefront of that explosion where he you know, takes off as sort of the ambassador uh, of Celtic music from Galicia. And I think it's important to note, uh, at one point, uh, the chieftains, um, embrace him and and want to support his you know his project and he becomes the you know they even call him the the uh, i think that was the, the seventh chieftain or something like that the fifth you know the fifth chieftain he he became one of the members of the band because they toured around and and he would join with you know the group and and he ended up recording with uh, many many artists from different parts of the world and his project is really all about uh, opening up Galician music, Celtic music from Galicia, northern Spain, to many different styles of music, especially his connection to Latin American music. What about Maria Marquez? I discovered her music on an, an album, a vinyl album on the Potato album. It was called Potatoes. And I immediately was struck by her voice. Let's talk she about her. She had, a, a, you know, kind of a already um, a budding career in um, in Venezuela before she decided to move to the States and, you know, and go to school here um, in the East Coast. Um, she recorded, a, uh, you know, two or three albums in Venezuela, and then she moved to study more, you know, more music in the U.S. and eventually landed and decided to, to live in the Bay Area. And I caught up with her actually one day when and she had just released a, a record on adventure music, a small independent label. Um, and uh, you know, I always, I always liked her voice. You know, you're 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 quite right. Uh, she has this really special gift. Striking of, voice, very striking, striking voice. And and I remember seeing her. She was she came to the she did a show at the at the Getty. I remember that concert and. And she has this kind of uh, almost, uh, um, I don't know, um, soothing kind of, you know, quality in her voice. And I, uh, you know, I really felt that uh, she, she had a really interesting story. She says, look, 
my roots are Venezuelan. My my I grew up and I listened to all of these Venezuelan musicians and masters. Says, but I also spent my professional life most of it on the in the U.S. So she says, I feel like I want to, you know, bring together the two and create something completely different. And that's kind of what she does. Uh, you know, that she what she's done over the years and the albums that she's released uh, in the U.S. Let's move to the chapter called Power. Yeah, uh, in Power, um, there is an artist I, I want to talk about. And uh, I mean, there are, you know, about 10 of them. But let's the idea here is the power that women have specifically to do something different, to create something for themselves, to empower themselves. And the singer, I think, that, that does that really well is a singer from Catalonia, Silvia Perez Cruz. Um, I knew about her from, you know, and you and you and I'm sure you did, too. Uh, she recorded an album with this um, Israeli percussionist that plays an instrument called hang. It's like a metallic uh, kind of percussive instrument. And I knew about her then. Uh, and then, of course, I knew of her work with the flamenco group uh, of all, all women. There were four women that were, you know, doing something different. They were not playing the traditional palos, the traditional flamenco stuff. They were kind of pushing the envelope a bit because they were not traditional flamenco singers. So they wanted to do something different. Uh, and, and then later she took off. She left that group and became her own just solo project. And she released an album of all original songs. Um, and the album was uh, dedicated to her father because her father uh, passed. And he was, as she said, one of her biggest influences uh, as, a, as a singer, as an artist. Um, her father uh, used to sing habaneras, uh, you know, these songs that came from Cuba. He would travel to Cuba and he would learn how to uh, play those songs and he would bring you know, found he found songs somewhere in the library, and he would bring him, and we would play him in these two clubs or these these bars in uh, in this small town uh, north of uh, Barcelona. And so she grew up listening to these habaneras and these songs from far away. Uh, but uh, then she decided that she wanted to you know, find her own voice, and she she found a producer who uh, produced an album called Granada, where they decided to push you know songs to a different realm and and arrange them differently so so she sings in four or five languages and they are songs that are performed in a completely different way some of them are you know well known songs some of them you know uh, are from spain some of them are portuguese there's a brazilian song but they wanted to do something different and she she said this to me i think what really encapsulates her attitude is I have to be able to uh, get into the song by understanding the story. If the story doesn't connect with me, you know, uh, as a song, as a story, then I'm not into it. Uh, I have to be able to tell that story by singing that song. Uh, and that's how she decided to, you know, pretty much carry on with her career. The next chapter is, um... Uh, about learning and music education specifically and it's about the youth orchestra of los angeles or yola which is really wonderful dudamel and he came out of el, uh, el sistema in in, in in venezuela talk about yola because they're a wonderful group based right here yeah i've been you know, I've, I've seen the, uh, the orchestra play several times, uh, you know, at the Hollywood Bowl and various places. And I was always sort of, you know, intrigued by the whole project. And so I got to spend uh, quite a few hours with, uh, with, you know, with the musicians uh, when they were rehearsing in a, in a small uh, in a kind of a, you know, like a, cultural center in uh, in Koreatown and um, and I went up and and I talked to the kids because I feel like you know this is a story of kids this is a story about kids in Los Angeles uh, the majority of them are Latino kids who come from you know 
difficult upbringings, dif difficult neighbors, neighborhoods, uh, you know, families that, uh, you know, certainly wouldn't have money to send them to a conservatory. So uh, they were lucky enough to be selected to be part of the, of, of the you know, of the orchestra. And I interviewed uh, several of the folks who are part of the project, you know, the sort of, you know, people that work for the LA Phil. And I, I was really, really, um, you know, touched by every one of their stories. You know, I spent uh, several hours with them. And then, um, you know, of course, I wanted to have an opportunity to talk to Gustavo Dudamel, who, you know, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, he's not a, a, an easy person to talk to because he has a very busy, you know, schedule. You know, of course, maybe not now, but, but certainly when I did uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, and I finally sat down with him and uh, very passionately, he, you know, he told me about Yola and he said to me, look, um, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for El Sistema. Now, let's just say that. I, I, I wouldn't be who I am if it weren't for the work that, uh, you know, Jose Antonio Abreu, the, the man behind El Sistema, created many years ago in, uh, in Venezuela. He says, and I felt that if I'm going to go to a city that has the wealth and the richness and the culture that other cities have, I wanted to bring that part with me. So I, I wanted to help create that as well here. It's like the the equivalent of a sistema lives in Yola. And that's what, you know, what I want to dedicate my life to. Because it's just, it's great to, to do concerts and it's great to do shows at the Hollywood Bowl and at Disney Hall. But it's it's also important, if not more important, to pass this music to the next generation. Very, very moving. And like you write in your intro, this is how music can change lives, young lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, even if a musician, even if one of these kids doesn't, you know, become a professional musician, it already changed his or her life. So that, to me, is, you know, a very important part of the story. It reminds me a little bit of Linda Udine in Viva Brazil. She also had something similar where she would take kids. And I remember her telling me that she once, there was one of, one of the kids learning how to dance Bahian style, Brazilian dance. And the kid would be going to practice and there would be gang members saying, hey, are you gonna come with us? And they'd say, no, these are middle school kids. No, I have to go to practice. I can't do it. I have to go to practice. And it kind of like, this is what these kids are up against. And this is why it's yeah. so important to, to, to have an organization like this in our midst. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, then, you know, the same could be said of the, you know, Oaxacan brass bands. There's a story in this same chapter about these brass bands that are all over uh, the L.A. area, and they do the same thing. They, you know, parents bring their kids, and the kids learn how to play an instrument, and it keeps them out of trouble. It, it keeps them busy. So it's a, it's a great thing, like, like I said. Whether or not this uh, this kid or the, you know this teenager or adolescent decides to become a musician, that's another story. But they are doing something now, and it really helps them in a sense. It will transform their lives. Let's talk about a most unusual musician composer from Brazil with an odd name, Ginga. <laughs> yeah, he told me the reason why he has that name is because. <laughs> You know, his, uh, I think it was his, his aunt when he was born, um, you know, he, he, uh, he, uh, he, he said his aunt would, would call him gringo because he was kind of, you know, uh, light skin or something. And he would say gringo, 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 gringo. And then he, and then he, uh, Ginga, the musician, would sort of, you know, continue to say that, but then eventually it sounded Ginga, 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 and it became Ginga. And he just adopted that as his nickname. <laughs> Funny. Tell us about him. <laughs> yeah. He, he's one of these just remarkable, remarkable stories to me. Uh, you know, he's a musician who wrote songs for some of the big names in Brazilian music, including none other than Elise Regina, one of the top singers in Brazilian music, you know, for my money, and, and others, you know, and many others. But his career just wasn't taken off. You know, he was composing, writing songs, arranging, but he, he wasn't going anywhere. Now, 
interestingly, his father said to him, you know, look, you can be a musician if you want, but you still have to go to school. You have to go to college. You need to go to, you know, so whatever you want to do, that's fine. But you need to, you know, go to college. So he went to college and became a dentist. So when things got really rough for him, when things got really difficult and he had a family to, you know, to, you know, to pay rent and, 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 and maintain and, you know, and, and nurture, he had no, no work. So what did he do? He decided to open his dentist office again and make a living because music wasn't happening for him. So, um, so he did that for a number of years, and he said, "You know, look, I, 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 I continued composing and, and, and playing music, but uh, I'm, I'm so, so happy." He says that my father encouraged me to go to college because, you know, uh, at one point he said um, he was delivering food that his wife was making around the block because he had no way to sustain his family. He, he just had he had no money to pay the bills. Uh, he had a very difficult time. So um, this is a very special you know, artist. Eventually, uh, Ivan Lins and a few other friends decided to create uh, a record label, uh, Veles, and, um, and to help his career, to launch his career and to get his work out you know, known and, and, and get publishing money and all of that. So um, that that was very significant for him as well. And Sergio Mendes also was a big supporter of Ginga. And Sergio Mendes, of Certainly course. Yeah. And in fact, uh, he, he's in the story because I, I got a chance, you know, when, when he played at the Blue Whale, Sergio Mendes showed up and, and I, I went up and I said, can I ask you a couple of questions? And, and yeah, he told me, you know, says, yeah. I, once he says, I showed the music, uh, uh, you know, to, to Henry Mancini. And Mancini looked at it and he goes, who is this? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you know, his name is Ginga. He says, he says we don't write music like that in this country anymore. <laughs> that was Henry Mancini talking about Ginga. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very different, uh, very challenging and amazing to listen to. And I'm thinking, is there a, a discography in the back of your, your voluminous no, heavy No, book? there isn't. There isn't. That's another component. And not you. <laughs> I'm going to have to do it in the next edition because this one has an index. So uh -huh. you, if you look at the back, you know, there's about 15 pages of an index that people can, you know, refer to and, you know, look at different names and, and so on. But no, no discography. <laughs> well, I hate to say that we need to sort of speed things up a little bit, but we want to allow a little bit of time for, um, for, for Q and a from, from yeah. the, uh, from the audience. Yes. So let's, move on to a subject we could spend a lot of time with, but we won't, Cuba and the diaspora. Yeah, I, I, I want to talk about uh, one uh, you know, musician that I, I have to say I was blessed and lucky and privileged to be in his company for about 40 minutes. The guitarist and classical composer and conductor, Leo Brower. Um, Leo Brower, for people who may not know about him, he is, you know, in a sense, the man who reimagined the classical guitar for Latin America. And he told me, amongst the many stories that he told me in those 40 minutes that we spent at his home in Havana, he told me that when he was a kid and he would go to the, you know, music stores in Havana and he would absorb and learn, you know, because he was, he was self-taught, he was didactical. So he would learn all of the music of, you name it, you know, Liszt, Hindemith, Beethoven, Mozart, all the great composers. But then he started looking and realized that there wasn't enough music written for the guitar. Everyone wrote for the piano, for the violin, for cello, for every other instrument, but the guitar was completely like left, put aside. And says, there wasn't that much guitar music so I felt like I had the responsibility to write music for the guitar. And, and so he decided to do that. Um, he wrote all kinds of pieces for the guitar, concertos, solo work, variations. I mean, you name it, he wrote, you know, for the guitar a lot. Uh, until, you know, then, and then he, and he was also performing it, but he broke his uh, finger um, on, his, on his right, right uh, hand. Uh, and um, and he stopped playing, but his music is still very much you know played by all kinds of different musicians. So he's uh, he's a really remarkable artist. And then the second 
a story that he told me that I want to share with you is when I walked into his house, his wife told me, you cannot ask him questions about politics. That's not allowed. Okay. I said, okay, no, I will not ask him about politics. But in the middle of the conversation, Leo Brower himself brought up the politics. <laughs> he said at one point, he says, you know, um, in the early 1970s, there was this minister of culture who considered rock, you know, degenerate. He says, you know, how could anybody say something like that? That's what, you know, the fascist, you know, Hitler would say of, of things, you know, music is not degenerate and it's just, American music is degenerate that, you know, it's not allowed. So rock and anything associated with rock and roll was forbidden in Cuba for, for a number of years. He says, can you imagine he forbid me of playing anything that was rock? Silvio Rodriguez, you know, we're talking about the most communist of all artists, Silvio Rodriguez. <laughs> you know, so Leo Brower was, uh, I thought, was it was one of for me one of the highlights of my career. He was a big fan of uh, the Beatles and he even uh, transcribed some of their work. That's right. On an That's album, right. and that was that was oh, the point that he was. Yeah, he wanted to make a point that look, this music may you know may be popular and may be massively popular around the world, but it is really great music, and we must respect it. And he wrote. You know, he did arrangements of the Beatles uh, for the guitar. I mean, really, really special, uh, gifted musician and composer. Let's talk about a bright young star who really burst upon the scene. Her name is Nella. Nella is uh, from Venezuela. She comes from a small town uh, in the island of Margarita, that big island facing uh, the Caribbean in, uh, in Venezuela. She, you know, she she was going to school in Caracas uh, at one point, music school, and her teacher said, you know, uh, you should apply to the Berklee School of Music uh, in Boston. She didn't think she could get uh, accepted. Uh, she actually had had uh, been accepted to the Los Angeles Music School, um, but she applied and she was accepted. And there is where she met Javier Limon, guitarist, producer from Spain, who's worked with, among others, Buica, uh, you know, Paco de Lucia, and so on. And, uh, and, and Javier Limon felt that she was a specially gifted singer and um, approached her about producing a record. He wrote all the songs. And next thing you know, she is asked to, you know, perform live for a movie by um, this Iranian uh, director uh, starring uh, Penelope Cruz and, uh, and Javier Bardem. And, and she was even on, in the, on the set and in the movie. And she sang sort of the theme song to, to that film. Um, and her career took off. She was nominated for, for a Latin Grammy as, as you know, Best New Artist. And she won uh, about three months after my, my story uh, aired on NPR. She's a really remarkable singer, and uh, I think she has a long career ahead of her. Can we jump a little bit ahead, in for reasons of time, and talk and talk about the your chapter, place and nation, and talk about kiosk? Um, yeah. What happened at the World Festival of Sacred Music, and finally, uh, Portuguese uh, uh, composer of Fado, Carlos the Carmel. Kiosk, um, I had been uh, sort of a fan of their work, thanks to our mutual friend, Yatrika Sharais, uh, who kind of introduced me to them. Uh, and when I first heard them, I, I, I just loved them. Uh, you know, they're singing in, in Farsi, but they're singing, you know, songs that sound like they were rock songs or, or you know, alternative rock songs. Um, well, the story is that this group um, wasn't even created in Iran. They were, uh, you know, they wanted to. But they still were banned there. They, they were banned. Yeah, they're banned. They're still banned in Iran, but they they couldn't play there because rock be is in, in Iran. Rock, rock, and everything is associated with rock. So, so instruments, uh, drum sets, you know, uh, anything that that sounds American rock is not okay so they would play uh in these underground uh, spaces uh it called kiosks you know sort of like playing in somebody's garage or uh, uh or basement because that's the, the only place where you could play that the neighbors are not going to hear you you know they obviously would 
make sure that the neighbors, if there were any neighbors nearby that, you know, that they wouldn't hear them or that or they were friends. So they would play in these uh, underground spaces and those spaces were called kiosks. And that's why the band took that name. Uh, but uh, interestingly, you know, the band has not been able to play in Iran. And obviously they hope that, they, you know, they're going to be able to do it someday. But uh, who knows when that's going to happen? Uh, so that's kiosk. Uh, the World Festival of Sacred Music. Um, I save that for the end. Let's save that for the end because that's really a fun little story. Yeah. Let's, let's turn. Um, to, if that's okay Carlos. with you. Yeah, yeah. Carlos Du Carmo. Um, I one of those again one of those serendipitous lucky moments. I was in Lisbon, exploring Fado, as I'm sure you've done. Um, you know. Going, I mean, you're going to say I'm crazy, but I was going from Fado House to Fado House. I was there for about a week or about yes, five, six days. And every night I would hit two or three Fado Houses because I wanted, you know, there were so many of them. I wanted to check out and see which ones were the, were the good ones. And of course, there are not some, some that were not so good and there were some really good ones. Um so halfway in that during that week, um, a friend that connected me to um, to Carlos de Carmo, uh, actually a, a friend that I that I met through a, a mutual friend from Spain, uh, he says, "Beto, um, would you be interested in interviewing Carlos de Carmo?" And I said, "Are you kidding me? Are you are you just pulling my leg? Is this a joke?" This no, he says, "I'm actually going to be with him tomorrow at the Fado Museum." And um, and he's gonna be here, and he would uh, love to talk to you if you if you want to you know spend an hour with him. I said, please, yes, absolutely. So I I met him uh, at the Fado Museum. We had a, a great time, and uh, he told me his story. and And the stories that I, the story that I tell in the in the book is the story of how Fado became what it is today. You know, as 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 you well know. Fado uh, was, you know, associated for the longest time with the dictatorship of Salazar, uh, the dictator of that, you know, was in power for, I don't know, 50 years or so in, in Portugal. Um, and um, and it was also, you know, it, it had this relationship with the, with the dictatorship. And it was also music that was associated with a different generation. And so a lot of the young and up and coming musicians want nothing to do with it until Carlos de Carmo recorded an album called uh, A Man in the City, Omen a Cidade. This album uh, features the lyrics, the poetry of none other than uh, one of the great poets of Portugal who happened to be a communist, <laughs> okay, who spent time in jail, who was in exile and so on. So he invited him to write the lyrics, and he also invited musicians who had been playing jazz and other music styles into the record. And that record itself marked a before and an after. It really opened up the, the world of Fado to a new generation, and people began to appreciate Fado as, yeah, you know, something to be proud of. This is music that we should all sing and we should be proud of. It's not because it's associated with, you know, a dictator or or this older generation, but it's it's our music. It's our voice. I have to thank uh, Don Cohen, a retired lawyer who knows so much about Fado and who wrote a book about Fado and used to come and uh, guest host an hour with me on Morning Becomes Eclectic a, a long time ago. So he always loved Carlos the Carmel always and he knows him and i want to say when when you interview big fado singers maritza or anamora you say well how did it start for you and they always say carlos de carmo yeah. so as a teacher he has been very very instrumental in the spread of fado and the emergence of these fabulous fabulous singers yes absolutely so find, what happened at the World Festival of Sacred Music that you wrote about in Place and Nation? Because <laughs> it's well, a bit of a surprise. I, I was, you know, I was curious um, as one of the, you know, the opening and the closing 
events or concerts of the festival. You know, this is a 10 day festival that takes place in Fez in usually the first or second week of June. In Morocco. In Morocco. Um, so, I, you know, I had been dreaming about going to the Festival of Sacred Music. So finally, I, I was invited and I went there and I spent the entire 10 days enjoying this amazing city. And I was dreaming. I would, I'll tell you that. Um, but the opening and the closing events are American musicians. So they open with, um, I think it was going to be, who, who's it going to be? Well, it, it was going to be the Blind Boys of Alabama. <laughs> and I said, okay, um, what is it about the Blind Boys of Alabama that you guys connect? I mean, you know, they sing in English and they sing gospel, you know, American gospel music, Christian gospel music. And, and so I was curious about that. So I started asking the questions. I, you know, walked around with my microphone, you know, asking kids, because that's the other phenomenon. A lot of the people attending that concert were young folks, Moroccans, not elder, not, you know, people our age. They were young folks. So I went up and I would ask questions to these groups of, you know, young folks, Moroccans. And I would say, why don't you like this? Well, and, you know, it's very soulful. It's it's very uplifting. It's it's you know really exciting, and we really connect with that. And I said, really? But how do you connect? I don't know. We just you know we just like it. It's vibrant. It's, it's really fun and happy music. All right, okay. So then I went and talked to the director of the festival, to the artistic director, it's a um, French uh, person, and I and I said, you know, tell me what is it about this music that you know, why gospel he says look you i'm sure already know that we have daily concerts of sufi music and you see how people react in these concerts right they they get up and they dance and they do this ululating and 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 it's like very exciting stuff right i said yeah well you know there's a connection there's a connection sufi music and gospel music it's the human it's it connects them because they feel something special about it and that is why people like gospel music because they feel like it's sort of like spiritual music <laughs> i said okay so it doesn't matter if they're muslim you know or or christian he says no it has nothing to do with the religion it's all about the moment the excitement the fun the euphoria of of listening to this music in live in concert <laughs> yeah, the, the first year that we, we that we did when I joined the Hollywood Bowl as the, the program director, we did a, a world a sacred music night, world sacred music, and we had Rahat Fatah Ali Khan, who was the nephew of the late uh, Nasrat Fatah Ali Khan, and we had uh, the Sacred Steel uh, Orchestra. And I'm trying to think of the Campbell Brothers, nice. and it all made sense that you know this is this is gospel music, the sacred music, and boy, does it like transcend cultures and language and everything else. People get it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly, and that's, and that is really at the at the center of you know of of the of the festival of sacred music, is that it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter the language. Music can touch you, whether or not you understand what they're singing about, and and it's it really you know because there was music from all kinds of different parts of the world there was music from there was one particular group that really elevated me during that festival and it was this group from zanzibar oh my god i had never seen or felt you know the power of something that was just something you can't really describe it was just electrifying it 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 made me it, it brought tears to my eyes it was so powerful, and I didn't understand one word. They were singing um, these Quranic verses, you know, <laughs> and I was really touched. So, why don't we um, sort of wrap it up? Um, this has been really great, but we want our, our 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 viewers to come in and ask questions. Yeah, there's already a question there from Shelley, who who says. How do you prepare to do an interview like the one with Carlos Du Carmo that you mentioned? Well, <laughs> I think the first thing is, you know, like especially the night before, uh, you know, I, I got the call and, and they said, you know, you, you can talk to him tomorrow. Well, 
read up as much as I can on him. Although it must be said, not much had been written in English about Carlos de Carmo. <laughs> so I That's know, what we talked to Don Cohen. Yeah. So luckily yeah. I already, you know, I, I, I speak some Portuguese. I, you know, I understand about 80%. So I, I went online and I started reading up. Of course, now, this is, of course, someone that I already knew about because I had, um, I had seen and heard about him when Carlos Saura, the Spanish director, had uh, done the film called Fados. And he's, you know, he's in that film, in, the, in this film. Kind of a documentary, well, there's more performances than documentary. Um, so I knew about Carlos de Carmo. I knew, you know, how important he was in Fado, but I didn't know all the stuff that he told me. So, yeah, I mean, you prepare as much as you can, but at the same time, you have to go in. And this is my attitude kind of in general when it comes to artists that I don't know much about. I want to go in and learn about them. I just go in humbly and ask questions like, you know, tell me about you know, what you're listening to right now. Tell me about, you know, you're growing up, you know, in, in Portugal, how, you know, what, what was your, you know, what were you listening to? You know, I didn't know that at one point he was very strongly influenced by Frank Sinatra, for example, but I wouldn't have known until he told me, you know, he, he said, he said to me, look, I love Frank Sinatra and, and I wanted to kind of do what he was doing for American music. So, you know, he, he was influenced by Frank Sinatra. I want to say Carlos uh, Saura's films on tango, flamenco, and fado are beautifully staged, very, very elegant presentation, just videos, and I highly recommend it. Recommend. Um, do we have another, another, another question? We don't have any questions right now, but we can definitely leave it open for a few more minutes if anyone wants to put any in the chat area. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, we can certainly, you know, continue talking a little bit while we get another couple questions, maybe. You know, uh, Beto, you know, I, I lived in, in France for a while and I had friends coming over. And, you know, European, the Catholic Church, the services are usually very quiet and very sort of solemn and everything you take them to a full and i would take them to a full gospel church um to show them <laughs> what gospel was like compared to a catholic ceremony and they just couldn't believe it <laughs> yeah so yeah. wonderful yes absolutely um uh, somebody's asking uh talk about the music of east la okay well it's that's that's a long response because it depends on the period. It depends, you know, what style, um, you know, we could mention, you know, some, something like, for example, two of the major figures of uh, American music were from you know, East LA. Um, <clears throat> they wrote all these uh, great songs. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember their names now, you know, for the coasters. Um, but, but, when we talk about East LA, say the 1960s, well, we're talking about, you know, artists like the Midnighters, you know, Little Willie G, uh, you know, that kind of sound uh, from, you know, from, from the barrio, from, you know, East LA as a sort of this kind of explosion of, of the sound of Mexican Americans. Uh, and, and of course, out. Richie Valens taking La Bamba, which is a folk tune, from Mexico and making it a huge hit. Yeah, although he wasn't from East LA, he was from Pacoima. <laughs> oh, sorry. A different, yeah, a different, a different part of Los Angeles, but very important nonetheless. Yeah, and I mentioned that in, in a couple of stories in the book. Um, but, you know, but also today, if I were to talk about East LA and the music scene, well, you know, it, there's a lot of stuff going on. I'll tell you a, a couple of things that are really important in East LA these days. The Song Jarocho music scene is really vibrant. It's really happening. There's a couple of stories in the book about, you know, about musicians from, uh, you know, that play Song Jarocho uh, that, you know, that follow, you know, in that tradition with Los Lobos who, who play that music way back when, before they even recorded an album, they were playing Song Jarocho. They went to Veracruz. They learned how to play this music. Um, but there's a number of groups uh, from, you know, that come out of East LA that, that play all kinds of great music. I mean, I'll tell you, uh, La Santa Cecilia, there, there is Las Cafeteras, 
uh, Quetzal. There's a story about Quetzal in my book about this this group that's you know very important group from from East LA, uh, and so on. So that's sort of you know a little bit of what what is happening today. Um, from Deborah, dream interview or one that got away. Wow, dream interview. I'm probably going to say an artist that uh, many of you may or may not know, Silvio Rodriguez. Uh, dreaming of interviewing him for years and decades, I actually should say, decades. I mean, and here's why. I'm from Mexico. I grew up listening in college to Silvio Rodriguez. He was, to me, uh, the equivalent to a lot of Americans, what Bob Dylan is. You know, he is, for us, he's our Bob Dylan. He talked to us. He had, you know, talked about what our concerns, our issues, our dreams, um, last year, I mean, it's, it's crazy that it happened during the pandemic. Last year, um, I thought, what the heck, you know, he put out a new record. I'm going to see if he's, you know, if I could do an interview. I contacted a friend in Havana and I said, you know, do you think he might be, you know, now that, uh, you know, this is going on? You know what? Let's ask. So she contacted the, you know, the person, the assistant that handles the interviews. The next day, she replied and says, Silvio says he would be happy to do the interview with you. I was absolutely in shock. I, I, I really couldn't believe it. it you know, because let's face it, this man, you know, he's done however many interviews you want to you know, you mention. He, there is nothing that I'm going to ask him that he hasn't said. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to discover something new in that interview. But just the opportunity to talk to Silvio Rodriguez is special. So I should, interviewed him. Yeah, and we yeah. should say it's in the book. And the, the story of that, you know, is in the book. Actually, there's two stories about Silvio Rodriguez. One about that interview that, you know, it's sort of a profile of his um, career in life. And the other one is a story about me in a small neighborhood, in a barrio, in a cosmic barrio in Havana, listening to Silvio Rodriguez with 500 people instead of 80,000 <laughs> because that's another thing that we should know is you know folks should know is Silvio Rodriguez gave concerts you know for 80 or 70 80,000 people in various parts of Latin America or Spain that's how big he is <laughs> so to see him you know surrounded by about 500 people in a small barrio in Havana was a dream come true and there's a story about it in the book. I think we have a few more questions coming. Mm. No, those were just comments in that the yeah. in the that question section. <laughs> okay. Um, what did you learn from writing this book? Well, I, I honestly, I learned about the book industry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know a lot about the uh, the music industry. I know something about the music industry, but I had no clue about the book industry. I learned all about how this thing works. <laughs> so that's one thing I learned. The second thing I learned is how do you put together a book? You know, it, it was, I would never have been able to do this book without the help of everyone involved. You know, the artists who did the cover, um, I should mention there are two books. There are two two covers. This is one, the one you have, Tom. And there's also this one. <laughs> now, the difference is in the size. See the difference? One, one is uh, 240 pages and the other one is 380 pages. One has photographs like that. And that's uh, a photo of Yola downtown at the music center and uh, here's a pianist uh, Areni Akbabian uh, Armenian American pianist um, um, and then there are photos like that like Emel Maluthi from Tunisia so the majority of the photos are mine I took most of those photos but I also got permission you know from labels like for example I got permission to uh, to publish Three photographs of ECM artists, including um, Arani Akbabian uh, and, uh, and, and Anwar Ibrahim. 
uh, Anwar Brahim. Uh, I got permission to, to put his photo there too. Um, but the majority of the photos I actually took uh, over the years. I just, so I, I, you know, I had to dig into my um, collection uh, in my, you know, sort of hard drive and, and, you know, and get some photos. So for example, this is a nice photo uh, of Carlos Nunez from Spain. We talked about him and that's his, his teacher actually, who's also a luthier who makes gaitas. And I went to visit uh, him. Uh, Carlos took me to visit his master, his maestro, in a little town uh, with, bordering with Portugal. Tui is the name of the town. Um, so the difference is this is not as um, not as expensive. <laughs> this is more accessible. And this one is, is more pricey because it's, you know, the paper and the, the photos and all that. And it's a, it's a bigger book. So that's that's why. Whichever book you choose, it, it's really a, a labor of love. Uh, your music from the cosmic burial, music take music stories from the cosmic burial, barrio. Um, it's a labor of love. You work really hard, and it's a it's a it's a wonderful read. Which whichever edition that you want, and I want to congratulate you on the book. You know, we in radio do so much work that just evanesces like vapor. You know, you do a show and then it goes. It's gone. If it's not, you know. But when you do a book, it's like, wow, you can hold your work in your hand, which is very different for a radio person. And I congratulate you. It's a wonderful book, and I can't recommend it enough. Thank you so much, Tom. You know, I, I, I just want to add to what you said. Um, I felt, you know, last year that, um, you know, looking at my career over the last couple of decades, I felt that I had enough of of a story to tell, to put in a book. And one thing that I have to uh, also mention is that I wanted the book to be physical. I want this to be, you know, a physical book as opposed to a digital book. I feel like um, I wanted to leave something behind, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to die, you know, uh, tomorrow, hopefully, but uh, I felt like I wanted to leave something behind. And, you know, you have a couple of books, Tom, and, and you know how precious they are, how wonderful it is to have a book with your name. And I just felt like, look, I have enough material for a book. And, you know, of course, now I'm going to have to look for material for another book. <laughs> so I haven't helped you really with that. But congratulations yeah. once again. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. All thank right. you. And thank you, Samantha. I think we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both so much. This was such a wonderful conversation. Loved hearing about your journey and your stories. And I hope everyone did. Um, if you haven't already, click the green button. We have the one without the pictures, but it's still special because it has all the stories. So thank you both so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, everyone who spent your Friday evening with us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. And everyone, take care. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Tom. Good night. Thank you, Samantha. You're Good night. You.